From BBC Two, Global Report travels to India to chronicle a most surprising success story, the Kerala solution. We're crossing Lake Vambanada on the regular ferry boat and we're very close to the southern tip of India. In a few minutes we'll be landing in the state of Kerala. Kerala is one of the more obscure and smaller states of India, only about the same size as Switzerland, but it has a population bigger than Canada's. It's also one of the poorer states, so altogether not a very inspiring combination. It would seem like just another poor and overcrowded piece of Asia, and not a place you'd expect to be in the forefront of human progress. But in recent years, something new has been happening in Kerala, and it's something which is important for the rest of the world. Imagine the British Isles suddenly having three times as many people, and you have a picture of what's happened in Kerala. But in the last 10 years, there's been an equally dramatic slowdown in population growth. Most babies in Kerala are born in hospitals, like this one in the busy provincial town of Kottayam. But the birth rate here now is one of the lowest in the developing world. Instead of having six or seven children like their own mothers did, Kerala's women today are deciding to have only two or three. <laughs> Canals and waterways connect up most of the 4,000 households in the lakeside village of Kumarakom. In one of them lives a young woman called Radha. Last year, she was sterilized. Yet she's only 25 years old, she only has two children, and they're both girls. Anywhere else in India, it would be unthinkable. Here in Kerala, it isn't even unusual. And what this means is that in a state of 25 million people, population growth has been brought firmly under control. In not much more than 10 years, the birth rate here has been halved. Why it's happened is something of a mystery. But in a world where rapid population growth is still one of the major problems of our time, the secret of Kerala's achievement would clearly be an important discovery. And if the answer is to be found anywhere, it's to be found where the population issue is really decided, in the ordinary homes of people and families like Radha's and her neighbors. Radha, married to an agricultural laborer, is constantly occupied with her young children. She depends a lot on her next door neighbor, a woman a few years older than herself and also married to a farm worker. Her other neighbor is a fisherman's wife who never stops working. These three Carolyn families live together in the same small compound. It's the kind of community you might find anywhere in India, except for one thing. All three have decided on small families. Radha, shy and the youngest of the three women, lets her husband tell of her sterilization. Her older neighbor, Penama, has two children. Ten years ago, her husband, Kunyu Kunyu, had a vasectomy. <laughs> In the third family, the mother is also sterilized. She and her fisherman husband have three small children. 
I asked them who'd taken the decision, husband or wife. <laughs> the decision was taken by Panama. <laughs> but did she have to seek her husband's agreement for this? Did you have to ask your husband's permission? <laughs> She got permission from the husband. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Panama? Did, did you? Uh, and that, uh, how did, and who that, decided? Could yeah, you, could you, you or, or Panama? Panama, Kunju, you are not Lara. 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 Kunju, Kunju, who took the decision? And you decided to go for a vasectomy after two children. And the hotel and I can use to me and add the man. That that's fairly unusual. Most most couples, it's the woman who goes for the sterilization. What made you decide to go for vasectomy? I don't know. I'm going to the man. 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 What about you, Kunya? Who decided, you or your mm -hmm. wife, rather, that you were going to have no more children? Whose idea was it? Kunya, Radha, you didn't have to operate. You didn't have to operate. You didn't have to operate. Radha, Kunya. Radha, who did it? It was Radha <laughs> who proposed. And did you not want to, to try for a, a third child? Were you not hoping for a son, rather? Did it not matter? <coughs> If the third is also a girl, what we will do? I'd like to ask this young man here, have you thought how many children you're going to have when you're married? <laughs> he don't he, he don't want even to marry. <laughs> like everywhere else in India, children are a big part of life in Kerala. It's not just a matter of religion or culture. Children bring joy and movement into lives which are monotonous and hard. And in India, where children's lives are so vulnerable, deciding to only have two or three is taking a big risk. In most parts of India, a lot of parents decide to have six children when they only really want maybe three or four because they know that some of their children are going to, to die. Now you're not worried that one or two of your children might die and, and leave you with only one child or even no children. Kerala doesn't spend any more money on health than the rest of India, but it spends what money it has on putting thousands of small health centers within walking distance of almost every family. Today, it's Radha's own baby who needs help. Her daughter, Regimen, has yet another cold. Without help, the illness could easily become one of the respiratory infections which kill a million Indian children a year. But very few in Kerala. <laughs> A 
a baby born here is three or four times more likely to survive than the average Indian child. And it's no coincidence that the Indian state with the lowest rate of childbirths also has the lowest rate of child deaths. Even though Radha's baby is malnourished, in Kerala at least her life will be saved. She often has fever and this stops her eating. I try to look after her but she doesn't want to eat. And she is only breastfed. She doesn't eat anything else. There isn't the money to buy her proper food. We can't afford to buy so many things. Most Carolans are poor. Poorer than average, even for India. But since land reform, almost everyone owns their own home, and there's a minimum wage law for agricultural day laborers. One of the three husbands earns about two pounds for eight hours' labour. Today, it's digging drainage canals ready for the rains. He's worried about the time when he can no longer work shoulder to shoulder with the younger men. And sometimes, he must wonder whether he was right to have a vasectomy after only one son. Another of the families earns its living from Lake Vambanatha. Karanagaran, the fisherman, owns his own boat and nets, so they're a bit better off than the other families in the compound. But to earn two or three pounds, he goes out at five in the evening and stays out on the lake until dawn. So even though the women also go out to work, all three families are poor. And poverty is obviously part of the answer to the riddle of Kerala's small families. Making ends meet isn't always just a question of income. Radha's husband is young, he gets regular work, and he should be able to support his family. But Radha herself often has no money at all. How much money do you get each day to look after all the household expenses and food for yourself and your husband and the children? I get 25 rupees a day, but only when he has work. Otherwise, just 15 or 20 rupees. If he earns 50 rupees, he will give me half, but it depends on what work he can find. Well, what does he do with the other half? He spends it on drinks and other incidental expenses. 
and what are Kony's incidental expenses? See, it really understand it. He likes to play cards and lay beds, which doesn't leave much. He smokes cigarettes and he likes to go to the cinema. So do you have enough money each day to really buy a proper diet for your children? There is never enough. Are you worried about your children? Of course I am worried. Our children don't walk like other children. They are not growing like other children. People in other states in India, they too are poor. They can't afford to feed and clothe and educate their children. And yet the average there is six or seven children. So being poor and not being able to afford more children just can't be the only reason. So why do you think it is that Kerala is different? And if, if a child is very bright at school, they're clever, even if they're poor, can they go on studying even after school? In a house just opposite the compound lives the 19-year-old daughter of another labourer. Outstanding at her schoolwork, her brothers pay part of their wages for her to continue her education. Tomorrow, she sits her BA degree in Indian history and political science. Again, anywhere else in India, this would be an unusual story, but not in Kerala. Almost all girls here go on to secondary school, and the literacy rate for women is three or four times the national average. Education makes Keralans more aware of the choices the modern world has to offer. But it also puts up the cost of having children by taking them out of the fields where they earn money and putting them into classrooms where they cost money. But doing the best you can for your children doesn't always work out the way parents might hope. The older family in the compound saves a regular 30 pounds a year by selling the coconuts from their three trees. For the last 10 years, Penama and Kunyu Kunyu have used the money for a special purpose. <laughs> Is this the eldest daughter here? Can we see? Yeah. This is she? Yeah. And how old is she now? Mm -hmm. Where is she? And Panama is obviously upset about this girl. What's happened to her? She's at a house nearby. It is a house where there is nothing for her. We had told everyone that she was going away to study to be a nurse. We made all the arrangements and we sold the little gold that we had. Then one night she disappeared. We searched for her everywhere. We went to the police station, but they couldn't find the boy who had taken her away. So we came home and went to bed. At three in the morning, the boy's father came and told us, the boy and girl are in love. You must settle the thing legally. I've had three children. The eldest one died. 
We paid for their education by suffering in poverty. We had no idea about this secret. We told no one about it. We lead a secluded life. We are the only Christians in this neighborhood. We thought our difficulties would be over when she finished her studies. Now it has become like this, and all our hopes are for our son. Parents like Panama and Kunyukunyu try desperately hard to educate their children. And education in Kerala is replacing fatalism with the attitude that life can be improved and misfortunes overcome. In the fisherman's family too, there's a serious problem. Child health in Kerala is generally good, but not all illnesses in the poor world are simple or easy to cure. And when a crisis occurs, what matters is how the parents respond. My eldest son is sick. He has bad kidney trouble. He has been ill now for three years. At the hospital here they injected him, but he started vomiting and then passed out. It was very serious. So what do you have to do? What are you doing about his health now? He needs to have an operation, but the doctor says he is too young for this. So we give him medicines and take his urine to be tested. We pay four rupees twice a week for the tests. And enough medicine to last four or five days cost 11 rupees. The doctor charges us 50 rupees for an examination. We both work to earn the money for the treatment. We have to cut down on food, clothes and household expenses to pay for the medicines for the child. What do you think would have happened to your child if there hadn't been any health centers or hospitals? Without treatment, he'd have died. Panamati doesn't just accept this misfortune. She's fighting it. Almost every day, she goes diving for clams to earn the money for her son's medicines. In so many other parts of the world, Poverty, illiteracy and ill health have left people with so little power over their own lives that they've little choice but to accept what life deals out to them. But in Kerala, the attitude of mind is now very different. Here, people are gaining the confidence to take more control over their own lives. and the improvements they achieve generate more confidence and more change. For Panamati's husband, Karanagaran, and the other fishermen of Lake Vamanatha, recent improvement has been dramatic. Up until two years ago, the price the fishermen were paid for their night's catch was decided entirely by the merchants, and they were regularly cheated. <laughs> but in Kerala, the state of affairs couldn't continue for long.
Kerala is the most organized and politicized state in India. Thirty years ago, it became the first place anywhere in the world freely to elect a communist government. Since then, it has changed government at almost every election. And today, Kerala is one of the most flourishing democracies in the world. It's also the most unionized state in India. And two years ago, the fishermen of Kumarakam formed their own trade union. Karanagaran is on the committee, and so are two of the fisher women. Now the merchants have to make bids for the fish in writing and hand them over to the union in sealed envelopes. Whichever merchant bids the highest price is awarded a two-month contract to buy all the fish caught by all the members of the union at the agreed price. The result is that the average income of fishing families has been doubled by their own efforts. If Kerala were a country, it would be one of the 20 poorest nations in the world. But unlike those countries, Kerala has solved its population problem. Taking big decisions which affect your own life, like the decision to be sterilized, is no longer alien to the people of Kerala. And planning your family is a part of trying to plan your life. Kerala doesn't offer any single answer, any neat blueprint for solving the population problem worldwide. What it does have to offer is one quite revolutionary idea. It's always been said that there'll be no real progress for the poor of the world until they get their population growth under control. Kerala has stood that idea on its head and it's made it work. It's shown and shown on a massive scale that it's progress for the poor which is the way to bring down population growth, the means as well as the end. Easy to get to health services for everybody, education and literacy for everybody, trade unions, minimum wages, land reforms, and some beginnings of progress for women. These are the ways by which the people of Kerala have won the confidence and the opportunity to take control of their own lives. And the result, in what is still a poor and struggling part of Asia, is one of the steepest falls in the birth rate that the world has ever known.
For next week, Global Report, News of the Second World follows the publication of one day's edition of the Soviet government newspaper Izvestia. You may be interested to know that the current edition of The Listener, which is unfortunately not available in the London area, contains an article which is linked to this series of Global Report.